Welcome to Monday Night Bible Study. We're uh, back in our study in Romans, and we're going to pick up in uh, verse 13 tonight. Uh, last time we, we looked at uh, really one of the key verses, especially coming through this sort of introductory part that we're still in, where Paul said in verse 11 that he longed to see them, that he may impart unto them some spiritual gift so that they would be established, established in the faith and established in <clears throat> clarity and confidence in God's plan and purpose for them as uh, members of the body of Christ in Rome, uh, ready and educated and able to do the things that uh, they needed to do and uh, be active in the ministry that they had there. So <clears throat> that gives us really a, uh, a, a, an insight that we need to know that this is the reason why Paul gave these instructions for us to, to establish us in the, in the faith, to establish us in God's plan and purpose, and in our confidence in it, to not only know what we're supposed to do, but we know why we're supposed to do it as mature sons and daughters. That's one of the things we we have. And, uh, you know, this is necessary so that we're not just wandering around, stumbling around, and no idea what we're supposed to do. And, uh, you know, like children, just waiting for God to tell us every move to make, which He's not going to do because He expects us to grow up and uh, apply the decision-making skills He gives us of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. And we're going to go over all those things when we get to, like, uh, chapter... 12 and 13 in there. Uh, and we'll we'll talk about those, you know, around in chapter 8 too when we talk about our sanctification. We'll go over some details of that. Um, so let's, we'll go ahead and uh, get into our study tonight. In uh, verse 13, we'll pick up where Paul says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Paul had been to some other cities, many other cities, had established many other churches, and these things that he's teaching in Romans, he had taught to these other folks. He had taught to some of the people like in you know, Ephesus and, uh, and uh, Galatia, and different places like that. And so, everywhere Paul went and was able to spend any time at all, <clears throat> the doctrines that he wrote down here in Romans for all of us to learn, he had been teaching those things. And his desire was to teach these things to those in Rome that they might be established. And here's something that he wanted them to be clear on. The reason he said, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, uh, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let or hindered, that word let in this sense means uh, hindered or withheld from being able to go to Rome to meet with those believers there. And knowing what we know about what happened in Rome, that uh, apparently not long after they received Paul's letter and were beginning to learn these things, and apparently were very effective in learning and teaching these things, Claudius came in and scattered them all out, or at least the Jews, expelled all the Jews from Rome. So I'm sure that disrupted the, the members of the body of Christ there in Rome. Uh, but Paul wants to make this clear that he intend, fully intends to come there and teach them these things. Now, here's our question. What is the largest religious denomination in the world? The largest denomination in the world. Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. <laughs> that was a trick question. That was a trick question. Now, yeah, it's, it's funny. We can laugh at that. But, looking at this phrase where Paul says, I would not have you ignorant brethren. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at the other places in Paul's writings where he uses that same phrase. And there's a very important reason why. 
Uh, so we'll look at that. But anyway, largest now now you know. If anybody asks you what is the what is the largest religious denomination in the world, it's the Congregation of the Ignorant Brethren. Hey, I used to be a member of that congregation, you know. So uh, anyway, there it is. If anybody at Congregation of the Ignorant Brethren, hey, they have branches in every town, <laughs> all over the place. You can find them everywhere. And here here's the thing. Now, Paul uses this phrase, ignorant brethren, several times, we'll examine why. But, let's, you know, let, let's uh, establish some things first. That he's not using the phrase in a derogatory way. He's not talking, talking down to them, saying, you know, you're ignorant, not in a sense of like we think. I mean, if we call somebody ignorant, we, in our, you know, usage of the, of the word, in our language... It's a derogatory term. But for him it wasn't. It just, it just meant there were things that they didn't know. The usage of the word is uh, agnoio, which is, means where we get directly ignorant, which literally means without knowledge. So it just means things we, we don't know. You know, honestly ignorant. Um, I mean, all of us are ignorant until we're taught. You know, I mean, if we were just born and nobody ever taught us anything, we'd never know anything, never learn anything. So it's the same way. It's the same way when we're saved, when we come to Christ. And this is one of the things that has just really bothered me for years and years and years. You know, being in church and, and all that was that it's like people get saved and then that's it. It's like a baby's born and okay, there you are, kid. Good luck. You know. Uh, be here on Sunday. Bring your money with you. And that's about it. You know, and there's no kind of set plan or purpose or program to teach anybody anything, you know, to, to grow up, to know what we're, you know, what it's all about, how we're supposed to conduct ourselves as Christians and all those kind of things. That's why the largest denomination in the world is the congregation of ignorant brethren. They're ignorant because they haven't been taught anything. And I, I've been in that too. But anyway, he's not using that in a derogatory way. He's indicating an important issue that they just don't know. So he's, he, he's uh, pointing that out to them. He doesn't want anyone in the body of Christ to be a part of the congregation of the ignorant brethren. <laughs> uh, and Paul uses this phrase as a warning in maybe not every place, but several of the places that he uses this. To indicate a specific doctrine that Satan was targeting. Um, Paul received a lot of negative, um, false accusation, false report, things like that. A lot of you know false things were told about Paul uh, because of his stand for Christ and. The fact that he was, you know, going against the Jewish religious establishment and all those kind of things. And, uh, you know, there may have been rumors, speculation, whatever, that uh, Paul's not coming to Rome. He's not ever going to come here and blah, 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 and so forth. Maybe those believers have been told there. So that's why he told them, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. I'm planning to come there, you know, because I want to have some good teaching among you, uh, just like I have the other Gentiles too, and so forth. But anyway, in some area, and it could have been that as part of Satan's policy of evil against Paul, um, these falsehoods and things were out there. And that could have been one of the things that Satan was specifically targeting. But there are some things that we're going to look at that are important things we need to know uh, and not be ignorant of. All right. Now, Paul himself was once a member of the congregation of the ignorant brethren. I was too. In 1 Timothy 1 he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So here's Paul's own testimony and we know about the Damascus Road experience. But here's one thing that 
the way Paul describes himself, blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, that, you know, we want to stop and remind ourselves of one of the things that God did with Paul. Paul, I mean, God took the man that was on Satan's payroll to try to destroy that believing remnant of Israel that, you know, Peter and John and James and the apostles and that group of believers before any Gentiles started to come in, they were still at Jerusalem and so forth, and Paul began to persecute those people and, and all those kinds of things. They were all Jewish believers, no Gentiles yet, because, you know, the mystery hadn't been revealed to Paul. He hadn't received his commission to go to the Gentiles. Gentiles could still be saved, but they had to become Jewish proselytes. You remember from Isaiah 56. Uh, but Paul was Satan's man. Satan was using him to try to wipe out the remnant of Israel before the rest of those prophetic things could happen. Satan didn't know what was, you know, in the future. Paul didn't either. But God took Paul, Satan's man, and turned him around to use him as the apostle to the uh, Gentiles and to the you know, body of Christ, Jew and Gentile. But Paul says, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. The reason he was ignorant, or what he was ignorant of, it were the things concerning uh, you know, the truth of Christ and so forth. Uh, he was ignorant of how the prophetic plan worked out in Christ's life and all those kind of things. And so, anyway, Paul admits himself, he was also a member of that congregation at one time. Jesus warned against being part of this group. Remember the background of this verse here, Matthew 22, 29, when the Sadducees came and they said, you know, uh, there's this woman, and she married a man. Well, he died, so her, the brother married her, had no children, and he died, blah, blah, blah. There were seven of these brothers. They all married her. None of them had children with her. They all died. So in the resurrection, whose wife is she going to be? And this is Jesus' answer to them. He said, you do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. So those Sadducees, and you could put the Pharisees in there with them, who were, you know, they were the religious bigwigs, muckety-mucks up there in Jerusalem, and they were they were part of the congregation of ignorant brethren. Jesus told them, you're, you're wrong, you're in error, because you don't know the Scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. So, keeps people in the congregation of ignorant brethren. But Jesus warned against that too. Now, let's take a look at some of the things that Paul does not want us to be ignorant of. In chapter 11, verse 25, he says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant, so here we've got, you know, brethren here and ignorant, of this mystery. Let, we know what mystery is he talking about. He's talking about the mystery of Christ and how that God suspended Israel's program after the death of Stephen, Israel diminished, and God opened the way of grace, and salvation by grace to everyone, Jew and Gentile, it's the time period we're in now. Church age, if you want to call it that. It's that mystery. So ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Now, what Paul is addressing here without going through the whole deal, and we'll cover all that, and uh, it's going to be really good when we get to Romans 9, 10, and 11. I think we can make a, a lot of things really clear about what went on with Israel. But even the teaching that Israel had been cast out and God was through with them because they crucified Christ, they rejected the offer of the kingdom once again, and God cast them out. So that teaching was prevalent in that day. But Paul very adequately combats that and, and to let them know, don't be ignorant of this, that God has not cast Israel off. This is, but that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, the fullness of the Gentiles, Daniel in his prophecies talks about the times of the Gentiles. We know that the times of the Gentiles started... Back, oh, anyway, it would have been between David and John the Baptist. At the Babylonian captivity, when Israel was taken captive 
because they had walked contrary to God time after time after time. So God finally walked contrary to them. They treated Him as though He was not their God. He treated them as though they were not His people and they were taken captive into Babylon. That's when the times of the Gentiles began. And since that time, Israel has never been a sovereign nation uh, since. We know that in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. They were scattered out all over the world and so forth. Came back to Israel in 1948. But even at that, we you know, know that, for one thing, Jerusalem is still trodden under the foot of the Gentiles. They're still really under Gentile domination pretty much. So anyway, the times of the Gentiles are still in effect and that when the fullness, when whatever God's plan and purpose is for the Gentile nations and events that are happening in the world and all those things, <coughs> when that's all completed, then God will restart His covenant prophetic program with Israel and He will finish up all those things. The day of wrath because of the seven year tribulation and so forth and Jesus will return, set up His kingdom and, and all that. Uh, so God has not cast Israel away. He wants them to not be ignorant of that and that's something we need to be very aware of today. We need to not be ignorant of it either uh, because there's a lot of people, churches, preachers, university eggheads that believe that Israel has been cast out and so forth, and all of those promises and covenants transferred over to the church. That's not true. It's called replacement theology. It's false. Uh, here's another thing that uh, Paul's very adamant about, adamant about. Don't be ignorant of counterfeits, which is idolatry. He's writing, you notice, to the Corinthians there. And remember, in 1 and 2 Corinthians... When we're reading in those two books, we have to remember that the, the, the core of Paul's instructions to the Corinthians is corrective doctrine, correcting mistakes they were making and errors that they had made. Because although the Corinthians were really, you know, a, a strong body of Christ, uh, man, they had a lot of the spiritual gifts like we looked at last week, you know, about the spiritual gifts and all those kind of things, they were still... Uh, you know, the congregation of ignorant brethren because they were misusing the things they had. And they had also continued to bring all that pagan idolatry right in there with them, you know. In spite of the fact that the majority of the Christians in Corinth were either ethnic Jews, descendants of Abraham and the Israelites, or they were... Gentiles who had come into the synagogue as proselytes. And then Paul came along, preached the gospel of Christ to them. They came into the body of Christ. They accepted Christ and were saved. But nevertheless, their background was still Jewish. That's why in Corinthians, in both books, 1 and 2 Corinthians, we find so many references to Moses and, and uh, the things that happened to Israel and this, you know, reviewing the history of Israel and so forth like that is the reason why. So in spite of the fact that they knew the scriptures and had a Jewish background, they had brought in a lot of paganism because Corinth was one of the most pagan places in uh, really in the Roman world in that time. Very decadent city. <clears throat> he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And we're all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat and drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Well, there's a reason why. In spite of the fact that they experienced all of the spiritual powerful demonstrations that God did and giving them all those signs that He did out there when they were in the wilderness, still, many of them were overthrown in the wilderness because they followed idols. <clears throat> now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil, evil things as they also lusted. Paul's talking to the Corinthians about the idolatry and all the wicked lifestyle that came with the idolatry. 
You remember there in Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council with the Apostle James, when Paul and Barnabas went up there, and, you know, and uh, had the not dispute, but they had the council over. Okay, it's obvious the Holy Spirit is working in these Gentiles. They're coming to Christ. They're receiving, the, you know, the gift of the Spirit, and all these things are happening. What are we going to do with these Gentiles? Because we couldn't keep the law. None of our ancestors could keep the law. We can't heap this on the Gentiles. So they said, okay, here's what we're going to tell them. And you can find these instructions actually in Leviticus, I think, 17 and 18. is where James was thinking about when he took this out of there. He said, tell them, uh, you need to get rid of everything that has to do with idolatry. You know, avoid, stop idolatry. Don't eat things that have been strangled. Don't eat uh, things with the, anything with the blood in it. And, uh, you know, abstain from fornication. Basically, those four things. And right out of the scripture. But, Paul, in, in the instructions he's giving them as a reminder of those instructions they were given to come out of the idolatry. He said, not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Reference to, they made the golden calf, had Aaron. Remember the old story with Aaron? They, you know, Moses has gone up the mountain. He's been up there 40 days. We don't know where he is. Don't know when. He's probably not coming back. Uh, we want you to make us a golden calf for us to worship. And so they did a whole big fiasco where Moses come down the mountain with the stone tablets, threw them down and broke them and, you know, smashed the idol to bits and all that kind of stuff. And when he confronted Aaron, do you remember what Aaron said? He said, I threw the gold in the fire and this calf came out. You know, man, did you not come up with a better excuse than that? So anyway, neither let us commit fornication, also one of the instructions they were given from James. Some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. So all these instructions remember, these are things that he says, would not brethren that you be ignorant. Don't want you to be ignorant brethren about these things. Don't be idolaters. All these things that have to do with idolatry. And they can see the parallel from their culture. Those things need to go. Fornication especially. It's like Paul nearly puts that at the top of the list. Because if you know anything about the um, temple, pagan temple worship and the ancient you know, Greek and Roman cultures had all you know, the temple prostitutes and all those kind of things. Also, in that culture, in that Roman culture, uh, it was common, really normal... You know, especially like the, the, the prominent men or the, you know, the uh, wealthy men, maybe not so much the, you know, the poor people, I, I don't know, but I know that those that were kind of in the society and culture, you know, they'd have the wife who was the mother of the children and she took care of the house and all that kind of stuff. But uh, the Roman men, uh, they could have as many other women as they wanted, you know, and so forth. And just kind of anything goes. So those were... Some of the things that Paul was having to correct in, in this group of people in their culture. Hard to root out, but uh, you know, he said those things have to go. Another thing is, these things he's telling them were things that they were receiving false teaching on. Satan did not want them to learn these things. Paul's teaching them. Because all these idolatrous things that were part of their culture, if those members of the body of Christ kept those things active in their lives, in the body, then they would have never learned. They would have never become what God wanted them to be. They would have never been effective uh, in their work for the Lord there in Corinth. So these things had to go. And Satan wanted to keep them ignorant of these things. He wants to keep people ignorant of these things today. He wants to give all kind of deceptions and counterfeits to excuse these kind of things away and, you know, justify 
all kind of sin, sneak in idolatry and all those kind of things and counterfeits and so on. <clears throat> See, now all these things happen to them for examples. The difference between example and example. Paul up there in the last verse, he said these things happen for our examples. It means they were uh, happened to show this point and give a uh, like a, a lesson for those on the outside. Also, those things happened unto them, Israel, who went through all those things in the wilderness and suffered all those things for in samples. That was in in house things they should have learned by those things that happened. So anyway, there's a some really interesting differences between those two words: example, in sample. Not going to go way all into that right now. Uh, and they are written for our admonition. And that is, uh, this word admonition has a lot to do with, if you remember last week when we were going over the spiritual gifts, and there's basically the spiritual gifts in that time because they didn't have the completed word that we have, those spiritual gifts were given to them to teach them how to function properly. And there were two categories, administrations and operations. Well, the admonition goes really right along with the administrations. They're written so that we'll know what to do and how to do it. That's basically the usage of that word, admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Remember, as far as Paul was concerned, and those believers alive at that time, it, they were they were expecting the Lord to return, you know, and these end time things to happen. I mean, they were they were in tribulation. They were under persecution every day. Now <clears throat> we're going to read the most misused, misapplied, misquoted verse in all the Bible. This is the one. This is one of those verses like Matthew seven one: "Judge not, lest ye be judged." Everybody knows this, but nobody quotes it right. This is the favorite verse of the congregation of the ignorant brethren. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, when, when people use this verse, what do they always say? Well, God's not going to put more on you than you can bear. Do we see that anywhere? No! That's not what that says. And besides that, what's Paul talking about? He says, he bookends it with, Neither be ye idolaters. These are written for our examples. Neither be ye idolaters, as some of them were, and they went through all these things. And those were in samples to them. It's written for our admonition. Flee from idolatry. So it's bookended with what subject? Idolatry. So we need to take this verse right here that has been totally trashed and misquoted and misapplied, and we need to make sure we apply this to idolatry. So that now in our well, I was gonna I was gonna backtrack into the congregation of ignorant, ignorant brethren and make a dumb statement, but I'm not. I caught myself, surprisingly <laughs> enough. We might think that we don't have much idolatry in our world today. Our culture is filled with idolatry. And remember, even back in those days, when a lot of those people were, you know, involved in some kind of idolatry, there weren't signs up there that said, this is an idol temple. You know, if you come in here or whatever, or in the, the, the meat market. They didn't have signs up there that said, this meat was sacrificed to an idol before it was put out here on the shelf for sale. So, you know, and there were other way more subtle ways that people became involved in idolatry, and they just didn't know. One reason they didn't know is they'd never been taught those things. Kind of like in our culture. It's filled with idolatry, and the churches are full of it. Christian people's lives are full of it. And we have, uh, you know, bought into this line. Well, it doesn't really matter. Eh, we, we don't believe that way, so it doesn't really... Don't confuse me with the facts and so forth. I think a lot of churches today think that 
the when you talk about idolatry, the main the first thing that comes to mind is worshiping a graven image. Yeah. You know, just just, mm -hmm. just a graven image, an idol. Yeah. But you're right. There's a whole lot more to it than just. And the worship. thing is, you know, and I'm not talking about the, you know, the the definition we get of idolatry. That's you know, because the preachers that are leaders of congregations of ignorant brethren uh, either don't know or they're too lazy to look it up or they're too afraid it might cause trouble if they talk about it. You know, well, idolatry is you get a new car or worshiping your new car or blah or your golf or whatever, whatever. You know, all that nonsense. That's not idolatry. Idolatry is a specific thing. And it is... Worshiping or taking part in the are you? Finish it. Tell me what Just you finish. need to do. Finish. Finish your statement. All right. Idolatry is active, actively worshiping some false god or being involved in the rituals, ceremonies, and things that have to do with that. Uh, you know, we're since we're on idolatry, I'm just going to go ahead and. and I've got it in my notes in a particular place, but I'll just go ahead and talk about it. Um, it all right. Hold up the sign. We need one of those. <laughs> whack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop. Go. Um, Easter is a pagan Roman holiday. Just because it says the word Easter in the Bible doesn't mean that Easter is referring to the resurrection. Where it says Easter in the Bible in Acts chapter, do you remember where? I can't remember where it is exactly. Herod, King Herod refers to Easter. And he's going to put Peter, Peter to death. I think it is maybe chapter 12. He's going to put Peter to death after Easter. Well, <clears throat> we know that, alright, there's you know, the resurrection and the Jewish Passover Correspond because Jesus' resurrection happened during the Jewish Passover. Easter doesn't always coincide with Passover. The reason for that is because Easter is a totally separate thing. It has nothing to do with the Jewish Passover. It has nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ. Easter is a pagan Roman holiday. It's a, a, a festival of fertility rites. Worship, you know, Isis and Ishtar and... Uh, uh, all those female goddess figures, Diana and Artemis and all those female, you know, fertility gods and so forth. All the way back to ancient Babylon, the whole Easter egg thing and, and all that goes all the way back to ancient Babylon. Remember here a while back when we talked about Nimrod and Semiramis and, and all and his mother and the whole thing. All that pagan worship originated back in ancient Babylon. So anyway... But those kind of things, you know, churches they have Easter egg hunts and all that kind of stuff. And hey, I used to be in that congregation of ignorant brethren before I learned. But here's the, here's the worst part of being in the congregation of the ignorant brethren, and that is not being willing to come out of that congregation. It's the willful ignorance. When you see the truth, either you read it for yourself and come to realize that, or... Somebody tells you, hey, that's not right, or look, this, this is what the Bible says, this is the biblical truth, and you ignore it and throw it out because it goes against the establishment, or it goes against what everybody else has always said, and whatever excuse there is to reject the truth and reject knowledge and reject God's wisdom and remain ignorant. Uh, that's willful ignorance, and that's just flat out wrong. But anyway, back to this verse. I'm not going to do that. Great study, as a matter of fact. In that verse, when we <laughs> accurately understand it, within the context that it's supposed to be in. So anyway, but we're just going to leave that as it is. Uh, but, it, but it is true, and it simply means what it says when we take it in the context, this temptation, remember that Satan as the tempter offers counterfeits and tries to get us to 
do things out of time or out of God's way or, you know, in our own power and things like that. But anyway, Paul's talking about idolatry. doesn't want us to be ignorant of that. Let's see. Uh, Corinthians said abund abundant spiritual gifts. We talked about that last week. They were using them inappropriately. And there in 1 Corinthians 12, I don't remember if we read this verse last week, but it starts off that chapter we looked at about the spiritual gifts. He says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now, when it comes to the, the work of the Holy Spirit today and the uh, use of spiritual gifts and all those kind of things, is there not a tremendous amount of ignorance today? I mean, you talk about some of the biggest groups of the congregation of ignorant brethren are those that are taking the spiritual gifts and trying to turn them into all kinds of things they are not, claiming things that are not theirs to claim, and claiming things that are in place today and are active today that are not. The spiritual gifts, remember from last week, the main thing, Paul did not want them or us to be ignorant about spiritual gifts is was the purpose for the spiritual gifts. And that was to establish them in the faith and teach them the things they needed to know until the word was completed. Also, those spiritual gifts were signs to those Jewish believers that God was now working through the Gentiles. In this dispensation of grace, Israel had diminished, and Paul, uh, I mean, uh, God was doing things in the Gentile believers that uh, the Jews thought were exclusively theirs. And so it was a sign to them too. And Paul wanted to make sure they understood that. We need to make sure we understand that too. Okay. He doesn't want us to be ignorant about suffering for Christ. 2 Corinthians now. And it's interesting. We go through all those things in 1 Corinthians. And man, everything's great. And boy, you know, uh, really kind of, I guess we could say, on fire. And the people were excited. And, and uh, a lot of people were coming to Christ. And they were going through all those growing pains and all those kind of things. And Paul, you know, wrote them that wonderful letter and taught them. And we know that they learned a lot of the things that they needed to learn. And, and his corrective doctrine was working in them. But then we start in 2 Corinthians, we find out that something else has begun to happen too. And that is Satan's policy of evil against them has begun to work. Because look what we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He starts right off. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounded, aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Now, salvation, the use, uh, usage here, not just our justification, our salvation from sin and death. This is the word sozo, which is, uh, means uh, physical salvation. You're like deliverance. We can say deliverance there. As well as your justification salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Now there's a corresponding verse, I didn't put it in the PowerPoint, probably should have, but I'll just talk about it. Uh, Romans 8, 17 so I'm looking forward when we, to when we get over to Romans 8 and we really get into the study of our sanctification. Great stuff in there. And uh, in Romans 8, 17, uh, Paul talks about that if we, uh, that we're, we're uh, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him. So this kind of goes along with that, that there's a, um, an element of when we are partakers of the sufferings of Christ, uh, there are some things that happen. There's like some maturing, establishing, solidifying things that happen that uh, really uh, kind of 
can't think of the right word I'm looking for. I don't want to say advance. Uh, anyway, in our sonship growth, there's steps there. And for those that do suffer for Christ, uh, those things happen. He says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. So this is Paul. I mean, things got so bad. And we know we can read in Acts there all those accounts of the places they went. When Paul was stoned, beaten, thrown in jail, uh, scourged several times, he said, you know, and beat up and all kinds of things. And that on top of all of the things that were being said about him, the false accusations and so forth, and uh, the attacks, constant attacks from those who disputed his word and were enemies of the gospel of Christ. So, all of those things. And now, the, the whole point here Paul's making is that those sufferings which he went through, they are now going through as well. Uh, and he wants them to know that uh, the things that he went through and was going through and those sufferings basically, you know, was was for them, and also that the benefit of taking part in those sufferings would also work out for their consolation, their comforting, their strengthening, and it built in them a unity in the body and accomplished some of the things that God wanted to accomplish in them through the suffering. And there's kind of a a school of thought in uh, these kinds of studies that there are certain things that require an element of suffering in order to be accomplished in us. Not that we can't labor with the Lord, walk in godliness, you know, be fully adopted, mature sons and daughters, laboring with the Father, we can. But there's something about suffering for Christ and enduring that suffering that strips away things that hold us back and hinder us down to where, you know, the things of the world just fall away. They don't have much meaning. They don't have much value. And our focus becomes so much clearer and uh, our, our clarity and our confidence in the Lord and what He has for us to do and our sense of purpose and mission become a lot clearer. Those are the kind of things you, that were happening there. And Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant that, that these sufferings are going to just tear you down and destroy you. No, God is going to take those and use them to accomplish His will in you. It's basically the things He wanted them to know. This is one of the, the doctrines of suffering and how suffering affects our relationship to God and, and our growth in our Christian maturity is a doctrine that Satan does not want us to know. He wants us to remain ignorant of it. He wants us to think that everything is just supposed to always be rosy and good. Uh, we're supposed to be healthy, wealthy, and wise and, uh, you know, always have plenty and not supposed to suffer for Christ and all those kind of things. That's what he wants us to believe. That's just not true. Now, he also says, he doesn't want us to be ignorant about the resurrection. The people in Thessalonica, they, were, they had been receiving some bad teaching about the resurrection. Uh, in fact, the people in Corinth had too. If you remember 1 Corinthians 15, Paul goes through that whole chapter. Uh, about the resurrection of Christ and just, I mean, nails it down. How essential it is and uh, so forth about His resurrection. So that they wouldn't be ignorant about it. Here in Thessalonians, the same thing was happening. Uh, there were those who were teaching that there is no resurrection. It's impossible for somebody to come back from the dead. From the dead. Jesus didn't rise. It was fake. It was, you know, uh, they stole His body away. All kind of things they came up with to deny Christ's resurrection. And there was a lot of doubt as to what happened to uh, the believers that had, that had died. Because remember, 
these people, they were, they were looking for the Lord's return and the resurrection and, the, and all those things to happen. Uh, so Paul's writing this to give them some instruction. So I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. You see, remember, he's not being derogatory about their ignorance. They just don't know. They're wondering, well, what happens to the believers when they die? Are they just dead? Or, you know, will, will they be resurrected? Or what's going to happen to them? Will we ever see them again? You know, what's going to happen to them? <clears throat> he says, sorrow not about those which are asleep. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, or we would say precede, uh, pre-event them which are asleep. And don't be ignorant about the Lord's return. He says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So Paul wrote this to them to make sure that they weren't ignorant of what's going to happen to the Christians that had already died. So yeah, you'll see them again. Because they will be resurrected when the Lord Jesus Christ arises from His place where He is seated at the right hand of the Father, when He descends from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and then those who are dead in Christ will rise first. And without going into a whole lot of other prophetic stuff, it's going to be at this point where the uh, nation of Israel, the believing remnant, will be gathered together back to Israel and so forth. Those of us that are lying remain and be, you know, receive glorified bodies and caught in the air to meet the Lord in the air. We go to the heavenly places. That's our place. Paul said our conversation, our place is in the heavenlies. The uh, remnant of Israel will go back. They'll go into the land where the kingdom will be established. That's the kind of the core of prophecy. But now, here's <clears throat> something too, and we want to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, part of the congregation of the ignorant brethren. It says, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. Now, I would like to know where those that believe that Jesus is going to secretly come back to heaven, you know, into the air and snatch all the Christians out mysteriously. Where do they get that? Where do they get a silent, invisible return of Christ in here? Because I don't see it. It looks like to me, and if you match this description with every other description in the Bible that has anything to do with the Lord's return, it looks like this. It's loud and it's bright with the glory of God and the trump of God and all these things. That's when the resurrection is going to happen. So, you know, not disputing what we think of as the rapture. This describes the rapture, just when it's going to happen. It's going to coincide with the Lord Himself coming again, when He comes again. And this matches the description everywhere else in the Bible about the second coming of Christ. So anyway, I just want to throw that out there. Because, you know, for years and years, like I say, I was in the congregation of ignorant brethren. And I'm just afraid that the day is going to come, and it may not be very far away, when... A lot of people are going to wake up and say, hey, wait a minute. These things that describe the seven-year tribulation are happening now. And all of you preachers told us that we were all going to be snatched out of here before any of the bad stuff began to happen. And we're still here, and it's starting to happen. So either you were wrong, or you lied to us, or you don't know what you're talking about. If that's the case, how can we trust anything else you have to say or have ever told us? So anyway, we need to make sure we're not ignorant about that. Or that regardless of what we 
particularly want to believe about the Lord's second coming, we at least need to know all of the different viewpoints so we can pick out which one lines up with what the Bible teaches, not which has become tradition and so forth and part of our folklore, religious folklore. So he doesn't want to be ignorant about those things. So how do people become part of the Congregation of Ignorant Brethren? A lot of us are born, a lot of us are born into it. <laughs> Here's one way people come into it, and they stay in it. He says, warning him about future time, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. He says they'll turn away their ears. Not that they never heard the truth, but they heard the truth and they turned away from it. They rejected the truth. Rejected the truth of God's Word and then turned into fables. That's why I use the word folklore because a lot of our religious belief is basically that. It's based on a lot of tradition and folklore that doesn't have any foundation in the Bible. This is one way that People become part of the congregation of ignorant brethren. How they stay in there. And even a worse shame than that is that there are a lot of preachers that like to keep people ignorant. You know? And they think, well, if they don't know it, then nobody else should know it either. Or for whatever reason. Uh, you know, a lot of reasons why they do that. It's easier to manipulate people when you keep them ignorant. Or tell them fables instead of the truth. Now, Paul instructs Timothy about delivering people out of Satan's ignorance trap in 2 Timothy 2. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Why do they need that? Because they turned away their ears from the truth and turned unto fables. Because they wanted, you know, teachers had just told them what they wanted to hear. And then uh, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Why is it that they can be taken captive by him at his will? It's because they turn their ears away from the truth and they would not acknowledge the truth. They wouldn't repent. When they were shown where they were wrong and they rejected it and shown what was right and shown the truth and they rejected it, they remained willingly ignorant and... Uh, remained in the snare of the devil and were taken captive by him at his will. Now, here's the thing. It's easy to assume that this is talking about lost people that never heard the gospel. This is not talking about lost people that never heard the gospel or unsaved people that never heard the gospel. This is talking about people that have heard the word and probably believed it. But for some reason or other, instead of staying in the Word and learning and growing, they stayed with the tradition, they liked the folklore better, uh, they liked the feel good better, or it was too boring to go to Bible class, or whatever, whatever excuse they had. And the devil's snare looked a whole lot better, it was a lot more fun, or whatever, and so they wound up taken captive by him at his will. Doesn't mean they were lost, which I believe I'm not going to go way off into this. I do believe it's possible for a, a person to turn their back on Christ and throw their salvation away, but that's not what this is talking about here. But this is how there are ways to bring people out of the congregation of the ignorant brethren, especially with God to this depth. Where they're taken care they're under the mind control of Satan. And we sure don't want to be there. Alright. So anyway.
Back to Romans. This is why Paul says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. <laughs> Oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was led hitherto. I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. And some of the things he, in fact, we'll go over these things in Romans. Things he wants him to understand are those things that we just looked at. Don't be ignorant about uh, idolatry and uh, uh, spiritual gifts and, and these other things. and you know Satan's traps and all these kind of things. Don't be ignorant of those things. Uh, here's the, th the, main, the main way to keep from being in the congregation of the ignorant brethren. And the way to get out of that and one thing we absolutely must have if we're going to grow in Christ and if we're going to uh, learn the things we need to learn to be conformed to the image of Christ and fulfill God's plan and purpose for us. We have to have a teachable attitude. We have to be correctable. We see something that we're wrong about, we've been wrong about, we need to examine that, we need to investigate, and if we see it, we need to be correctable. You know, if we're full of pride or arrogance or whatever, we're, oh, you know, that's what we've always, that's what I've always believed and I'm not changing and so forth. No, that's not saying throw out everything we've always believed, you know. But if we do see where we're wrong, we need to have a teachable attitude. Uh, if we don't, we're going to remain in the congregation of the ignorant brethren. So, anyway, in a correctable spirit. All right, anybody got anything this week? Go ahead. Alan. Something you said at the very beginning about um, uh, what, what we should be doing. Well, yeah, well how do I say this? Okay. Something I've done in the past, mm -hmm. I'll admit, within the last week, when I pray, mm -hmm. it's like uh, I pray for God's guidance to use me where He sees fit. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, exactly what you said, we need to, don't do that. We need to figure it out ourselves. Well, in a sense, yes. It's kind of yes and no. We, we shouldn't be like children and I know probably all of us have done it all of us we you know serve the Lord in different ways we've been in church all our lives and all those things all of us have probably prayed it sometime God I just wish you just show me what to do just tell me what to do I'll do it okay and we were and we were confused and frustrated and we couldn't understand why God didn't do that well <laughs> this is one of those things it was like a Bam to me way years ago in studying the word, and I finally saw he's not going to do that because he doesn't want us to stay as little children. He wants us to grow up and step out there and learn to make good decisions. Now, unless we learn the wisdom and justice and judgment and equity in those good decision making skills that he gives us in his word even if we're making decisions on our own and in faith stepping out to show some responsibility and take some you know some risks well we may very well make bad decisions but in a way still in God's grace that's okay because if we're doing that he's going to then he's going to then direct us he's going to turn us that's why we call it a walk of faith because if we're walking, we're moving in a direction. If it's not the right direction, God can turn us. But it's not a sit-down of faith. It's not a sit-down of, God, I'm not going to move till you tell me what to do. Or you're going to be sitting there a while. Now, but that's not to say that we shouldn't ask for direction and guidance. We should. But what we need to realize is that the main place we're going to find that is in the Word. You know? And I'm not saying that God's not going to... A lot of people don't believe God speaks to you in a, not like an audible booming voice from heaven, but it's like 
you hear it. I don't advocate hearing voices in your head and stuff like that. A lot of people don't believe God speaks to you. I'm just going to tell you I do. But I hate to throw out a statement like that because then everybody, well, he said God speaks to you. So any imagination that comes in our mind, we think, well, God told me to do that. You know, People will say, well, God told me to run off with my secretary and all that kind of stuff. No, he didn't. <laughs> uh, so we should seek God's direction, I believe, in prayer. But we, we need to do that with the understanding that He will give us that direction, but primarily it's going to come through His Word. And in that direction, He wants to make sure that we kind of know what, where we are. If we're, you know, uh, if we're kind of right there at some maturity, uh, some responsibility and things that, uh, you know, we can make our own decisions and take some risk and move forward because we're, we're, we're understanding. See, here's the thing. The mature, fully adopted, I mean, this is not adoption as we, not American adoption. This is adoption like fully go with the plan, adopt the plan, it's good, everything about it, fully go with it. The fully adopted mature son, the reason he's effectively laboring with his father is because he knows the way his father thinks. He knows what his, what his father wants done. He's, he's incorporated into the business, basically. Knows what the plan is. Knows what the goals are and what the purpose is. Has use of the resources and all those kind of things to, to move forward in the business. Uh, even if we, we're you know, not to that point yet in our walk with Christ, uh, one of the things we'll have clarity and confidence on is what level of understanding we're at. And I believe that as we learn these things and grow, um, we should ask God for direction. But that needs to be kind of under the umbrella of understanding that we have, knowing that He may not work, He may not just lay it right before us. And if we need to make a decision and move forward, it's okay to do that. Even if we're a little off, really that's okay too, because He'll He'll direct us and He'll straighten us out. Uh, you know, it's not wrong for us to be honestly wrong, as long as we're not in rebellion or disobedience. That's the thing. You know, as long as we're in, we're in obedience to God, we're seeking His will, then, uh, I mean, He's our Father. You know, it's like a little kid learning to walk. They stumble and fall one time. You're not going to just, you know, I'll give up on you. You're never going to learn to walk. No, we pick them up and keep on until they learn how to walk. So, anyway, if that answers your question, you're, you're not wrong in that. And we're, we're never wrong in asking God for direction and so forth. But we need to understand that he may not just, you know, lay out a whole detailed plan for us, you know. Uh, we need to know what spiritual gifts we have, what our personality type is, and all those kind of things, what opportunities we have, what resources we have, and bring all those things together. And that'll give us a pretty good idea of what our particular purpose is in Christ. Also, we need to keep in mind that uh, God doesn't need any lone rangers. That He has designed it so that the body functions as a body. You know, the foot doesn't go off here that direction while the hands want to go over here and do something over there and the eyes looking up here and the ears listen to something back there. No, they all function together to, you know, accomplish something productive. So anyway, those are just some kind of things and we'll cover a lot of those things in more detail as we go through here. Receptive part to his leading. I mean, just because yeah. you show me what to do, well, you must know to your heart as well, because he speaks to that as well. Because yeah. you know, so he can listen to your heart as well, but you also know to listen to Yeah. You can read scripture and it can speak to you. Well, and that, that's right. Because that really is the effectual working of the word that we have we've put the word in, you know, our heart and mind. 
And then the Holy Spirit takes that that we're, you know, we have implanted in us and, you know, quickens it in our heart. He uses the word that we know to then direct us, to, to speak to our spirit. You know, Paul even talks about it over there. You know, the spirit bears witness with our spirit and so forth. So yeah, that's that's right. That is how the effectual working of the word in us works. So that's why it's so important that we learn the word. Because what God does in us, he's going to do through his word. He's not just going to, you know, pull something out of the air that doesn't line up with his word. And if we don't know the word, then uh, that's going to limit the really limits the working of God in us because that's the way he set it up, you know. So, yeah, that's good. Well, Carson, one thing on that too is he may not he may not give somebody direction before the opportunity comes to use it. And well, so that's true. as mm -hmm. as as like you say, as mm -hmm. you study and you know how he thinks and how he wants us to behave mm -hmm. and conduct ourselves, then when something comes along that you know good and well, you mm -hmm. know, the Lord's in this, or this is an opportunity for me to do, then He'll give you what you're equipped. You're That's equipped. That's the thing. So. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. Yeah. Equipping us with, there in Ephesians 4 12 that we read a lot for the, you know, perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the equipping of the, you know, the body. All right. Good discussion. Anybody else got anything? All right. Let's have a word of prayer.